For all your honest, unbiased, unsponsored gimbal reviews, feel free to subscribe because we've got more coming. Okay, like all my gimbal reviews, we're gonna go through the design, the features, and the changes from the previous, and whether or not you should upgrade. And then we're gonna take it outside to see how it does in terms of performance, and also its maneuverability, okay? Now the naming is a little bit different. This is the upgraded version of the RSC2, whereas the RS3 Pro is the upgraded version of the RS2. Okay, so don't get that confused. Depending on where you are, usually it comes in two combos. First one is the basic gimbal setup. Now, if you purchase the combo package, it comes with a gimbal, a carry case, you do get one of these hand grips as well as a follow focus. This is the pack that you get. Now in terms of material, both bags are very similar, whereas the newer bag is a little bit harder. So a little bit more rigid, a bit more protection. Now in terms of the opening of the design, it's a bit different as well. Both are layered, except one has a double zipper design, whereas the new one is a single zip and inside slides out, similar to a laptop bag. Now, of course, you can also purchase the Ravenite image transmission, which I'll go through a little bit later on. That's an extra cost. In terms of size, we can see that the RS3 seems a little bit taller, very similar, but if you look at just the body, this is much smaller. One is because the RS2C is a foldable design, whereas the new RS3 is not. See, like that. Now, because the body design, this extra bit makes the whole body a little bit taller. Now, in terms of the hand grip, you can tell straight away that the RS3 is much smaller. We have a smaller hand grip, but the thickness is relatively the same. And the hand grip material is the same, so the both feels pretty comfortable. Depending on your hand size, if you have fairly big hand size, this might be a little bit, you know, stretching it. As you can see, I'm feeling the top and bottom just right. Now, for the first time, the RS3 used a removable hand grip battery. So, all you have to do, press, and the whole thing comes out just like that. Similar to our RS2, this is the same design. Now you might be wondering, are the batteries swappable? Well, let's have a look. You can actually put it in, but the voltage is different. And I suspect it's because the motors use a much more powerful uh, voltage. So even though you can put it in, I do not recommend, okay? You are going to burn the motors. The RS2 hand grip is swappable with the RS3 Pro, okay? So I, I think they use the same motors as well. Okay, so both comes with the trigger button as well as a zoom focus rolling wheel. Now in terms of smoothness, both are very smooth. With a bit of resistance, I think these are very good. Now in terms of trigger, the RS3 feels a lot better. Can you hear that? Whereas the RS2C is very muted, very mushy. Okay, turn it to the side. Now you can see both come with these NATO rails. This is something we saw in the RS2. Now the only difference is that the RS2 NATO rails come with extension ports. This is actually used for tilter heads or you can use external batteries, etc. Whereas the base model, the RS3, does not. So I assume the RS3 Pro would come with the same NATO rails as well. Okay, but at least the size is the same. So that means you can use previous accessories onto this NATO rail. Now, what is not on the previous generation is the mode button. So now they've added a quick mode button, which is always welcome. Okay, looking at the front, it looks very similar to the RS2. Uh, both have a joystick, except the mode buttons and the power button are switched across. Now, the joystick is actually shorter. The less travel gives them more precise control. But the biggest change is the screen. You can see in the previous RS2C model, we have a one inch OLED display. Whereas this time, we've got a 1.8 inch colored touch display. Okay, it's touched as well. And that's a big change. And this should be the same screen as the RS3 Pro. Okay, now moving on. Now most gimbals these days do come three access lock. What's different about the RS3 this year is that it's a little click like that. Super easy. Now, in fact, one of the cool features is all three access is automatic. That's right, it automatically locks and unlocks when you turn on the gimbal. I'll show you a little bit later on, but let's move up and look at the actual motor or the gimbal itself. In terms of size, you can see both are similar. In fact, they are similar. Now, like all my tests, I'm using a M3 with a GM2470. This is generation one, so it's actually the heavier version. Now, the reason I use this setup is one, because this is one of my heavier setups. Two, all my gimbal reviews, I use this setup, so you can compare the footages if you want, just so it's an apple to apple comparison in terms of stability, okay? But before we test, let me show you something else. This is the handrail. Now you can put this on left or right-handed, so up to you. Let me just put this on quickly. And of course, the handle is adjustable, so pretty easy. Now on the back, we have a quarter inch mount as well as a cold shoe, so you can extend your monitor and anything you want on the back. Now both uses a step up quick release. That just helps with quick setup. You can take it off, shoot, and then put it back on. Now, one thing to keep in mind, even though the size might be the same, this is not interchangeable. One reason for that is because the RS3 now comes with the same adjustable knob 
that we saw on the RS2 and this is really good. So you can make minute changes. So you can put the RS3 plate onto the RS2C, just like that, but you cannot put the RS2C quick plate onto the RS3 because it has an adjustable gear. Now the RS3 quick release is a little bit bigger, so you do have that extra bit of surface contact. Now on the side we have these holes, this is to bolt on the rails for the forward focus and we didn't have that in the previous version. Now because I'm using a fairly long lens, are we gonna hit? Well, yes, slightly. But if you use this smaller lens or a shorter lens or the generation two lens, it's gonna be perfectly fine. Now underneath, we have a lot of clearance. Now you could say, okay, I could move this forward a little bit, right? You're gonna sacrifice a little bit of stability, but you can get your whole camera across just like that. Now remember when I said the three axes actually automatically unlock? Check this out. How cool is that? And when you're done shooting, everything locks into place, super convenient. Now, of course, you can turn that off in the settings, but that is a cool feature. Now, let's check out the menu. We've got the all new menu design, and it's very intuitive. So you've got the functions for your motor to adjust and automatically tune. You've got your gimbal status, as well as the most common use of modes. So you can press this and change modes. So you have portrait mode, as well as 360, and then you've got your FPV mode. And also you can go to custom mode here, and then you can choose whether I want to have tilt activated or roll or both, or all three. Now remove this, obviously then you will be in lock mode. So now, and of course you can also adjust the speed of the gimbal in which it moves. Now there are some presets from fast to medium to slow. And of course you can customize your own settings from 100 to down to five. Now swiping upwards, joystick speed, joystick smoothness, and then you can customize the dial function. Now, as you can see right now, this is tilting. Pan, roll. And of course, you can also control the shutter, the aperture and the ISO, as well as the focus motor if you have that connected to the camera. Now, what's unfortunate and like all previous models is that you cannot customize the trigger button. So that's one thing that I personally don't like is the fact you have to hold on to the trigger to be in lock mode. Now, there are two ways to go into lock mode. One way is if you press the trigger button and then you press the screen again, it will lock itself in lock mode. And then you would have to tap again and then it'll go back to the previous mode that you're in. Now, alternatively, you can also set the mode so that all three axes do not move and then just switch to that mode in the customer section, which I showed you in the menus before. You can also slide down and you have lock screen, your camera Bluetooth connection, which is automatically connected to my camera. Once you pair it once, it's really quick and easy. And then you've got the silent mode as well as your settings. Now in settings, there are quite a few options. For example, you can choose the whether or not to automatically lock your access gimbal when you turn on and turn off the camera. So go through this. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, this is not a menu tutorial, but you get the gist. In terms of modes, this is pretty covered. You're not gonna get anything different from the other gimbals. Now, if you purchase the Raving Eye transmission set, this is an actual purchase. You do have the actual features of active track. In terms of overall active track, it's pretty good and it's actually very fast. When I turn on to the maximum speed, you can see it's able to track me from left to right, not a problem. Now we test this with someone walking in front of me or even stopping in front of me. Now if you're walking fast enough, it shouldn't be a problem. But if you have someone moving very slow or stationary like I did, this is a fairly extreme test, you are gonna trick the camera thinking your object has stopped and it's gonna lose track. Now we've also tested this locking on a subject while walking around without even looking at the subject. It did a fairly good job. So I think this is fairly good if you're a solo shooter or you like to have this, you know, following your subject, walking around. For me, I don't think I use this much. One, because I think it drains more battery. Two, a lot of hassle putting it in and taking it off. Third, I think I'm just more confident running it myself. You get a lot more smoother transition during your orbit shots and I think I'm competent enough in shooting such shots. And if you're not, follow my tutorial on show how to shoot a perfect gimbal, that's coming soon as well. Now, apart from active track, you also have the opportunity to monitor your subject. You have false color, you have zebras. You can also use a LUT uh, to really convert your log footage into say a Sony 709 so you can have a fairly accurate depiction of what you're shooting. Something that's convenient, uh, you don't need a monitor for, but that's something to keep in mind. Now, how does a fair actual test? Now, I've actually did a previous test in my Chinese version, so I'm gonna show you a couple of footages with my voiceover just commentating on what I experienced. Okay, so this is a rotation test, and as you can see, we are pretty much in our limits. Now, if we turn the other way, it is pretty good. 
And if we go all the way down, not a problem. Very smooth, no vibrations from the motor. Double click is a selfie mode, triple click, and it reverts back to normal. In terms of maneuverability, this is pretty good. Now this is 360 vortex mode. Keep in mind vortex and portrait mode can only be shot with a top-down handheld motion. It is quite heavy, so you definitely need the optional handheld grip in the combo pack to really support your shoots. Okay, next let's go for another extreme test. This is in POV mode. Kids, do not try this at home. I'm actually quite worried that the camera might fall off, but this is for you guys. So if you like this video, feel free to leave a like. As you can see, if I move too quick, the camera does not catch on and is stuck. But the good thing about this is all you have to do is double click and the camera centers itself and you're good to go again. But as you can see, if you go really fast like I am, which most of you won't, you're gonna meet with some limitations. But the good thing is double click with the trigger button and you are going to be back to normal again. So I think this is a really good feature. At least the algorithm has been updated, which is great. Now let's go outside, do the same test. I'm gonna do it both with the 24 and the 70, both walking and running and with the IBIS turned on and off. Now I'm using 70 millimeter just to exaggerate if there is any vibration, especially when I'm running without the IBIS turned off. Now, just to be fair, none of my gimbals I've tested in my lifetime, and that's a lot of them, can run 70 without IBIS turned off and it's still stable. Okay, there you have it. Let me know in the comments what you think. Is it good, is it bad, is it worth upgrading? Now, my honest opinion is whether or not you should upgrade. If you already own a Ronin or a DJI SC2, probably not. Given that both the payload is the same at three kilos and the size is not much a big difference. It is sexier, it has a few funky functions, but overall, you want the gimbal to shoot a capable image, and I think the old version is pretty good. Now, if you don't have a gimbal, if you're using a mirrorless camera, if you're using a big setup like this, I recommend go for it. This is a great gimbal, it's very capable, it looks great, but how does it compare to the other gimbals? Well, you would have to watch my ultimate gimbal showdown test, where I cross-reference all the gimbals that's come out in the last two years, and we'll go through one at a time, which one is suited for you and which one I recommend. Okay, hope you like this honest review. I'm George, I'll see you in the next one.